Um, he's now Professor Emeritus. He doesn't mention that he was head of department. Apparently those, uh, those years are the ones he cares to forget. However, for me, when I arrived in 69, uh, George, uh, Professor Poling, was one of the role models that, uh, that, I, that I had. He may not have known that, of course, and for many of us, we don't realize who we act as role models for. Uh, the last time I saw him before this conference was at 2010 when I, I, I gave a lecture at UBC. It was eight o'clock in the morning, and George, remember now retired at least from the university, he turned up to listen to my lecture. So when I was in this position in, two th in 2016, I was uh, an honorary chair, was a natural component, and I thought of George. And it's been my pleasure to be able to uh, invite George to act as an honorary chair of this uh, IMPC 2016. He was not only a representative of the best in Canada, I think in terms of mineral processing, one of the eminent professors worldwide. So thank you very much for agreeing to do that, George. But he then said, well, give me something to do. So I thought, ah, the legacy plenary for the last day. So George, please join me up here and host the final plenary session of IMPC 2006. Well, thank you very much, Jim. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure, <coughs> pleasure for me to be, be with you, to see so many old friends and to meet so many new friends. And uh, it's, it's been a pleasure for me to, to be your honorary chairman. Um, and we're talking about legacy. Uh, legacy. Today, today we're going to be dealing entirely with three speakers who will impress you with the legacy that they're leaving. And, and I looked up, uh, just last night, I looked up the meaning of legacy. Now, the standard meaning coming from your computer is an amount of money or property left to someone in a will. <clears throat> that didn't quite apply. So I looked a little further, and the second definition is anything handed down from the past as from an ancestor or predecessor. Maybe Psalm was right uh, in his comments last night about this session uh, being sort of predictive that some of us don't have too much longer to live, but I hope that's not true. So legacy. I know there are lots of, still lots of young people in the audience, and I think you should think about legacy, and you should think about making a plan for what your legacy will be. I mean, we're all in this business of trying to improve the science and the technology and the practice of minerals recovery. And at the same time, we have to achieve that with a minimal impact on this magnificent globe that we call Earth. So you're going to, you're going to hear from speakers today who have incorporated all of these, all of these aspects. And I, I hope that it will inspire you to plan to leave a legacy so that when you get to the same age as yours truly, that you can look back and say, I'm really proud of what of the legacy I'm leaving, and I hope my children and grandchildren will be equally proud of that legacy. Our first speaker is um, going to be, it's the inauguration of something new from the CIM in Metsoc. So, my next job is to call on Sam McCusa, to, uh, who's chair of the Metsoc Historical Society, and he's going to introduce our first speaker. Sam is also a life member, and it's a pleasure to welcome Sam to the podium. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is it is Sam Marcusen. I'm the chairman of the Historical Metallurgy section within the Metallurgical Society, where we have had 40 years of historical metallurgy, part of our annual programming at the Conference of Metallurgists, most notably through our historical metallurgy lecture. Two years ago, 
We revitalized our group, choosing to emphasis on the late 19th and early 20th century to provide a legacy to recent people about how we got to where we are today. A signature project that we have done in this time is we have assembled with partnership of the Canada Science and Technology Museum oral histories in video format of some 80 leaders in Canadian mining, both from the business, academic, labor, and Aboriginal groups. This has been a real success for us. We found tremendous support and interest. We also found uh, reason, we, we obtained reasonable funding to do this project in, in a timely and efficient fashion, hiring professional historians to do the work. What we have provided is a panoramic snapshot of the Canadian enterprise as it exists in the early part of this century. I would think that it's great that we have an international uh, organization here because if we could get similar projects by other professional societies through the world, around the world, we would not only have a local or national view of the mining enterprise, but we could have a global snapshot of the mining enterprise that exists at this present time. And what a gift that would be to future generations and legacy to future historians. Historian colleagues of mine, when I show them what we are doing, they are extremely pleased that such is going to exist. You can see uh, some of the interviews, snippets of the interviews, most of the interviews about one and a half to two hours long, by Googling Canada Science and Technology Museum Oral History of Mining, or you, if you can write down and remember that URL, it's there as well. Also, you can contact me at that email address, and I will talk with you about how we did this. So now, I'd like to come to the next part of our thing, which is to have our historical metallurgy speaker. This year, this is the first historical metallurgy speaker to be named in honor of Professor Fati Habashi, who is, is a professor emeritus at Laval University and a longtime practitioner of of historical metallurgy, and last year we named this lecture after him. So for the first Fadi Habashi lecture in historical metallurgy, our speaker is Emeritus Professor John Monhamius, Monhamius, who held the Roy Wright Chair in Mineral and Environmental Engineering at the Royal School of Mines in Imperial College. He was Dean of the Royal School of Mines from 2000 to 2004 and has more than 40 years experience of academic and industrial research and development in hydrometallurgy and environmental control. He's published more than 130 papers in the scientific literature and supervised more than 30 PhD students. He's also worked as a consultant to industry. Interestingly, he was a, a, one of the driving forces behind the first uh, symp symposium in iron control in hydrometallurgy. And early in the week, I asked him for some color that we could add to his, to his introduction. And I, I gather he has skill sets that go well beyond hydrometallurgy. He told me that in the early 70s, he had a visiting position at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and he was presented with his laboratory space, a big empty room with one sink and no money. So he marshaled the local forces, the local uh, people, and he built a laboratory from scratch that produced six MS students in three years. He also reported that he enjoyed the beach life in Rio de Janeiro. I'm not sure what exactly that means, but there is a lively beach life in Rio de Janeiro. And he said that he likes the samba. 
So I believe that after the lecture, he is providing consultation in laboratory design and in doing the samba. Professor Monheimius and the topic of his talk is the Iron Elephant, a brief history of hydrometallurgist struggle with element number 26. Well, thank you, Sam, for that uh, introduction. Um, you suddenly realize that age is catching up with you and that technology is moving on a pace when you're asked to talk on the history of a process or a technology that you've grown up with. And this was my reaction when out of the blue I got a, an email from Sam uh, last year asking me if I would give a talk on the early development of iron control in hydrometallurgy. Now, once I got over the shock of realizing that I was living history, um, I was, of course, flattered that it was going to be here at the IMPC, this prestigious uh, series of conferences which has been going since before I was, uh, came into the business, and that this particular IMPC was to uh, take the, um, include the fourth uh, symposium on iron control in hydrometallurgy, made it even more attractive uh, because, as Sam said, I was involved with my friend uh, John Dutrisak over there as we were, we were co chairman of the first one, which was held in um, Toronto 30 years ago now. Now, I first became involved with iron at the very start of my career in hydrometallurgy. The uh, research topic for my master's degree thesis at UBC back in the mid-60s was the reductive leaching of goethite with sulfur dioxide. My thesis supervisor was the late Professor Ian Warren, who himself was a protege of Professor Frank Forward one of the founding fathers of uh, modern hydrometallurgy. Little did I realize at that time, which is now 50 years ago, that the problem of iron and how to deal with it in hydrometallurgical processes would be a theme that would follow me throughout my career. So what is it? about iron, iron in hydrometallurgy that has merited four decennial conferences. The first one, as I said, in Toronto in 86, in 96 in Ottawa, 2006 in Montreal, and now 2016 here in Quebec. Not to mention the thousands of scientific and technical papers, research papers and patents that have been published worldwide outside these conferences. Well, let's start with a few facts about the geological occurrences of iron, element number 26 in the periodic table. Now, as it says there, iron is the fourth most abundant element in the Earth's solid crust. And it is an essential component of the crystal structure of over 600 minerals. Iron in non-ferrous ores, occurs or can be uh, divided into three types of uh, minerals, ore minerals, gang minerals, and solid solution minerals. Now, I'm not going to go through, through these in detail, but in ore minerals, the iron is an essential constituent of the uh, mineral, uh, which is used as a source of another metal. And a clear example of this is uh, chalcopyrite, the main all mineral for copper, and for every ton of copper you get out of chalcopyrite, you produce a ton of iron, which you've got to do something with. Gang minerals, uh, well, iron's in many gang minerals, and I suppose one of the key ones that we're all familiar with is pyrite, uh, FES2, which of course is often the major component of many sulfide ores. 
And then we have the solid solution minerals where iron substitutes <coughs> for uh, in, uh, in the mineral structure of something uh, else. And the key one here, which we shall be talking about a little bit uh, in detail, is uh, sphalerite, uh, zinc sulfide, the main ore mineral for, for zinc, which can have up to 17% of the uh, zinc can be substituted by iron uh, in the sphalerite matrix. So given that non-ferrous metals have been produced for thousands of years, <clears throat> one might be forgiven for asking why, suddenly, has iron become the focus of so much attention by non-ferrous metallurgists? And the simple answer is that it's due to the rise in the importance of hydrometallurgy compared with pyrometallurgy for the production of non-ferrous metals. In the traditional high temperature smelting processes, uh, iron in the smelter feeds ends up in the slags, together with many other deleterious impurity elements. Iron in silicate slags is present mainly as phalite, ferrous silicate, Fe2SiO4, which is a chemically and environmentally inert material, which can be safely discarded without detrimental effects to the local surroundings. This benign method of discarding unwanted iron is one of the main advantages of pyrometallurgy over hydrometallurgy. Now, to understand the problems faced by hydrometallurgists who want to discard iron, we need to remind ourselves of the uh, chemical behavior of dissolved iron. The most concise way of doing this is to use an EH pH, or Pourbaix-type diagram. Now, I'm not going to go into this in any detail, <clears throat> but um, suffice it to say that the iron uh, can be in solution as ferric, that's Fe3+, or ferrous, Fe2+. And the rest of the diagram, I don't know if you can see the, the, uh, the regions there on the, on the Pourbaix diagram, but the rest of the diagram Iron is actually out of solution. It's there either as ferric hydroxide, ferrous hydroxide, or right down at the bottom in the reducing conditions, it's there as iron metal. Now, the relatively small area of solubility of ferric iron, that's the bit in the top left-hand corner, shows that theoretically it's quite easy to get iron out of solution by oxidizing it to the ferric state and then making sure the pH is greater than three. And this will swiftly cause the iron to precipitate from solution as ferric hydroxide. Most other common base metals will stay in solution under those conditions, and so you can make an, a ready separation of iron from the things like copper or <coughs> zinc, et cetera, in solution. Now, the precipitation of so-called ferric hydroxide is a very complex process which even today is not fully understood, and it was even less so back in the 1960s. The usual result of rapid hydrolysis and ambient temperatures is the formation of a ferric hydroxide gel with an open network structure producing a soft, low-density material with a very high internal uh, area. Now, this open structure of the gel occludes a lot of mother liquor, which makes filtration and washing of the gel extremely difficult. In practice, this latter property means that, in general, it's not practical or economically feasible to use hydroxide precipitation to remove more than about one to two grams per liter of iron from solution. Now, this was the situation with regard to iron precipitation up to the early 1960s and it manifests itself most clearly in the electrolytic zinc industry. And so, in looking at the history of iron control, we should start there in the zinc business, um, where many of the iron control processes that we are familiar with today were, in fact, first pioneered. So, briefly, the 
electrolytic zinc pro process is uh, very simple and can be described by three chemical equations shown there on the slide. The first one is the roasting step where the zinc sulfide, the sphalerite concentrate, is roasted in, in air to form zinc oxide and sulfur dioxide. The zinc oxide is then dissolved in sulfuric acid to make zinc sulfate solution. That is then purified and then passed to an electro-winning cell where the zinc sulfide is uh, electro-1. The zinc is electro-1 onto the cathode. Oxygen is produced at the anode. And sulfuric acid is regenerated in, in the electrolyte, which can then be recycled back to uh, leach some more oxide, uh, uh, calcite, as it's called. There we have a simple flow sheet of the process, um, <clears throat> roasting there on the right-hand side at the top. And then the calcine goes into a two-stage leach. Uh, first one is a neutral leach. Uh, and then it moves from that into the acid leach, where it meets the electrolyte coming back from electro-winning. Um, and that uh, is where the main dissolution takes place. Purification then, which I won't go into, and then round to electro-winning. This process is often referred to as the uh, roast leach electro win process, the RLE process. Now, during the roasting process, any iron in the zinc concentrate, which typically can run as high as 12% iron in the zinc concentrate, that iron will combine with zinc to form a mixed oxide known as zinc ferrite. ZnFe2O4. Zinc ferrite is insoluble under the conditions of acidity and temperature that are used uh, to dissolve the major zinc oxide part of the, of the calcine. And thus, in the traditional two-stage leaching process, ferritic zinc reported to the leach residue. It didn't dissolve. And so this resulted in recoveries of zinc typically in the order of 85 up to 90, 93% zinc recovery. The rest went out in the residue. These relatively low recoveries were the most serious drawback of the electrolytic process and restricted its use to low iron zinc, content, uh, zinc concentrates. And this was the situation in the mid-60s at which time about 40, 50% of the world's zinc was produced electrolyti electrolytically, with the re remainder still being um, produced by various pyrometallurgical processes. Now, it was well known even then that zinc ferrites will dissolve readily in sulfuric acid, provided that you use strong acid and high temperatures, close to boiling point. However, under those conditions, most of the iron dissolves along with the zinc. And so the problem then was, what did you, how, how, how could you cope with that? Because the only method they had in those days was to precipitate it as hydroxide. And as we've seen, you can't do that successfully uh, under plant conditions. So a step change. Oh, press the wrong button, sorry. There we go. <clears throat> a step change in the history of zinc ore processing occurred around the mid-60s when several processes were developed in which iron could, could be precipitated from solution as crystalline, easily filterable materials, which could be readily washed to remove the leach solution. Such materials include iron oxides, both hydrated and uh, anhydrous, and importantly, it includes the basic iron sulfates known as jarosites. These new processes were incorporated into the traditional process, uh, zinc process, so that not only oxide zinc, but also ferritic zinc could be recovered from the calcine feeds. And with this, typical recoveries rose to 95 to 97% in most uh, plants. 
Now, the most important of the iron removal processes developed in the 60s is the jarosite process. <coughs> and I apologize to those of you who sat through the uh, um, three days of the Iron Control Conference. I'm sure you've heard enough about jarosites already, but I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, jarosites uh, is um, one of a group of basic uh, ferric sulfates. The composition is M. Fe3SO42OH6, where M represents a monovalent cation from the group comprising sodium, ammonium, potassium, silver, rubidium, lead, or water itself, or hydrogen ions, if you like, H3O+. Precipitation is brought about by adjusting the pH of the solution to about 1.5, so it's quite acid, and taking the temperature to close to boiling, 95 degrees centigrade, and then adding a source of the monovalent uh, iron. In, in industrial practice, this is usually ammonium, sometimes sodium, which makes the ammonium or sodium jarosite. The equation is given there on the slide. Uh, I won't go into it. To ensure that the reaction goes to completion, it's necessary to neutralize the hydrogen ions produced by the hydrolysis reaction you see on the right-hand side of that equation uh, to maintain the pH at the operating value of around 1.5. Now, as occasionally happens with technological advances, very similar versions of this process were developed independently and virtually simultaneously in different parts of the world. In this case, patents on variants of the jarosite process were lodged by zinc companies in Spain, Australia, and Norway within months of each other in the mid-60s. Mid in fact, these three companies later formed a consortium to, la uh, to license jarosite technology to the rest of the world's zinc industry. The jarosite process has been described extensively in the literature. <clears throat> it's very flexible. It's capable of being readily integrated into existing as well as new plants. And it's adaptable enough to cope with different plant practices. The integrated jarosite process developed by Norzinc incorporated most of the various process options and a simplified process flow sheet is shown on the slide. Comparing this one with the previous one, you'll see it's got a few more unit operations in it. I don't intend to go into the details of the process. Firstly, I haven't got the time, and secondly, it'll bore most of you silly. So um, those of you who are interested, I suggest you uh, read the paper. But basically, what we see there, are, there are actually three extra unit operations over and above what we saw in the, in the basic uh, zinc process. Um, and these are called pre-neutralization, jarosite precipitation, and jarosite leaching. So we get three new unit operations there. Um, and by putting those in, you get this uh, dis uh, dissolution of the um, uh, ferric, sorry, the ferrite, the zinc ferrite, in the hot acid leach, you take the temperature on, on the acid leach up to uh, the temperature required to dissolve the ferrite, and then you get the iron out uh, through those three extra process, uh, process um, steps there. Overall recovery of zinc by this process from typical zinc calcines containing 10, 11% zinc is around uh, 97, 98%, with very similar high recoveries of other valuable metals in the calcine, such as cadmium, copper, lead, and silver. OK, moving on. The Gertite process is, there are three processes, basically, which came into being around the time we're talking about in the mid to late 60s. The second one of these was the Gertite process. And in this process, iron is precipitated from solution as a hydrated ferric oxide, FeOOH. The process used commercially was developed a few, a few years after the jarosite process by the Société de la Vieille Montagne in Belgium. 
and it involves a reduction step to reduce the iron to ferrous um, and then to then oxidize it back to ferric under conditions of about 90 degrees centigrade and a pH of around 3. And under those conditions, if you do it properly, you get gertite forming rather than ferric hydroxide forming. And the gertite, again, is a crystalline material which uh, is filterable and washable. Um, there is no reagent requirement, so you don't have to add a monovalent uh, reagent uh, into the uh, tank as you do in jarosite. So there's a cost saving from that point of view. And theoretically, there's no sulfate removed from the system either. In the case of jarosite, because it's a basic sulfate, you are actually taking sulfate out of the system as you precipitate jarosite. In the case of gertite, you're not. However, in practice, sulfate contamination of the gertite is quite heavy due to absorption and the formation of some basic sulfates. And the iron product usually contains 2 to 5 weight percent sulfur. The gertite process does not have the inherent flexibility of the jarosite process. Very careful control of the conditions during precipitation, especially pH, is required for successful operation of the, of the process. The relative solubility of gertite in sulfuric acid is a major disadvantage because the iron precipitate cannot be acid washed to recover any undissolved calcine arising from the, uh, sorry, any un undissolved zinc arising from the calcine which is used to, again, to mop up the hydrogen ions produced there, uh, as you can see on the right-hand side of that equation. So you need a, a neutralizing agent during the precipitation. The uh, flow sheet is shown there. Again, I'm not going to go through it at all, but the first uh, stage of, of the, float, of the um, process is the reduction stage. And then there's a pre-neutralization and then the precipitation in the third unit operation there. So moving on swiftly, um, <clears throat> I'll press for time with this thing. Uh, the hematite process. This process brings down iron as hematite, that is the um, unhydrated iron oxide. Uh, this was first developed in Japan by the Akita Zinc Company and was put up into operation in 1972. So it's a few years after the two we've been talking about, the other two. Again, it requires a reduction step to uh, get the iron into a ferrous state before precipitation. And then precipitation is done in autoclaves at um, <clears throat> around 200 degrees centigrade and a total pressure, uh, it's done with oxygen as the oxidant uh, 200 degrees centigrade at a total pressure of around 2 megapascals or 300 psi. The reaction is shown there on the, uh, the bottom of the slide there. And um, you can see that the product is hematite, Fe2O3. The residence time in the autoclave is around three hours. And the final solution after the precipitation will normally contain three to four grams per liter iron. And that's returned back to the main leach circuit. At the high temperatures used in the autoclave, um, hematite will continue to form even in relatively acidic conditions. So you don't have any necessity to add a neutralizing agent during this process. Uh, in fact, you can't. It's difficult to get, get it into the, into the autoclave anyway. But even if you could, you don't, don't need it because um, the iron comes down under pretty acidic conditions. And uh, so this is a major advantage of the of the process, um, and theoretically, there should be no zinc loss at all because you're not putting in that calcine to, uh, to consume acid. However, in practice, the hematite will contain typically half to 1% zinc, uh, together with about 3% sulfur in the uh, so-called hematite. OK, so those are the three processes, the main ones which were developed at that time. <clears throat> of those, the, oh, that's the flow sheet there. Uh, again, I'll skip over that. Um, again, it's in the paper if you want to look at it in any detail. 
So let's just have a look at the materials that are produced by these um, processes. Um, for a typical sphalerite concentrate containing 53 weight percent zinc and 7 weight percent iron, the compositions and the quantities of the iron residues that would be produced by the three iron processes we've just been talking about are shown in this table. Now the top line there shows the weight of uh, iron residue produced per tonne of zinc produced um, out of the process. So for every tonne of zinc, if you have a jarosite process, you've got about half a tonne of jarosite to get rid of. <clears throat> if you make it a goethite, if you go through the goethite process, you have about a third of a tonne. And if you go through the hematite route, you'll get about a fifth of a tonne. And that's because, of course, the different iron compositions, contents of those residues. So a typical zinc refinery producing 150,000 tons of zinc per year has to dispose of about 75,000 tons of jarosite per annum. A similar sized plant using the goethite process would have to get rid of about 50,000 tons. And if it were using the hematite process, it would have to get rid of about 30,000 tons of hematite. Now, when these processes were first introduced in the late 60s and early 70s, disposal of the iron residues was not considered to be a difficult or onerous task. Different disposal strategies were adopted depending on the local circumstances of each plant. Thus, Norzink in Norway used to dump its jarosite into the field where it was uh, uh, situated. In Australia, electrolytic zinc used to ship its jarosite in barges out to the edge of the continental shelf and dump it straight into, into the deep ocean. Asturiana de zinc in Spain, like many other plants that followed it, disposed of its jarosite in line tailing ponds in the vicinity of the plant with recovery and recycle of the processed water from the ponds. So there we see uh, the, the field at where Norzink is situated. They used to chuck the um, their jarosite into. It's very deep there, of course. Um, they don't do it any longer, as I'll show you in a minute. Uh, there's the ocean barge transport to take stuff out to the uh, uh, deep ocean. And there's a jarosite pond, just to show what they look like. So the initial success of these iron control processes, which resulted in much higher zinc recoveries from the electrolytic process, um, also widened the range of zinc concentrate compositions that could be treated economically. And this all led to a re an acceleration in the replacement of the older pyrometallurgical zinc plants by the more modern, so-called cleaner, electrolytic process. And thus the proportion of world zinc produced electrolytically jumped from about 45% in 1960 to about 75% by 1980. However, this period of growth in the use of the process coincided with the birth and the growth of the environmental movement and the introduction of environmental legislation and stricter regulation in much of the industrialized world. And it wasn't long before the environmental activists and subsequently the regulators began to target these iron residues produced by the electrolytic zinc plants around the world, and in particular, those producing jarosites for discard. They targeted these as being sources of long-term pollution of the environment. Now, licenses for new jarosite ponds became harder to get or in some countries, impossible to get. But the zinc industry, having sunk so much capital into building electrolytic plants, and having no alternative technology for zinc production, um, had to, turn, had to uh, spend much of the next couple of de de decades, trying to the 80s and the 90s, trying to 
devise workarounds to try and keep their processes running. So we see some of them there on the slide that uh, Norzinc now disposes of its gyrosite in excavated caverns, has to dig caverns out of the local rock and put it in there. It can't put it in, in, the, um, uh, in the field any longer. EZ ships its skirtite now to Port Piri to, and puts it into a lead smelter. Boudel in Holland treats only low zinc, uh, sorry, low iron zinc concentrates, uh, brought all the way from Australia, from the Century Mine in Australia. And then here in Canada and other places, they've uh, devised things called Jarro Fix and Jarro Show, where they mix uh, jarosite with iron and, uh, sorry, with cement and um, lime to try and stabilize it uh, in the long term. And indeed, this goes on. I mean, there have been papers this week about what to do with jarosites and how to, how to uh, get, around the pro get around the problems. So the, the, pro the, the problems still exist. And that's where we are today, really, uh, with, the, with the zinc process. Just to finish off, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but <coughs> uh, just give me a couple more minutes. The Iron Elephant, the title of my, of my paper. At the recent um, hydrometallurgy conference, the decennial hydrometallurgy conference, which was held in Victoria two years ago, and indeed here this week, the concept of the hydrometallurgical copper smelter has reared its ugly head again. And thus, in spite of the vast amount of research and development work carried out in the last quarter of the 20th century, last century, to devise hydrometallurgical processes to produce copper from sulfide concentrates, all of it ultimately commercially unsuccessful, the goal of a hydrometallurgical process that can compete head-on with modern copper smelters continues to tantalize upcoming generations of hydrometallurgists. The elephant in the room that haunts and thus far has defeated the hydrometallurgical copper smelter concept is how to deal successfully with the iron in the copper concentrate, hence my title, The Iron Elephant. The size of this elephant for would-be copper makers is several times larger than that faced by today's zinc producers. A typical copper concentrate runs around 30% iron and 25% copper, compared with a typical zinc concentrate with around 10% iron and over 50% zinc. Thus a ton of copper produced hydrometallurgically from copper concentrate would necessitate the disposal of around six times as much iron as that arising in the production of a ton of electrolytic zinc. Given the difficulties faced by today's zinc producers in disposing of their iron residues in ways that satisfy the demands of the regulators, the NGOs and the general public, the task of disposing of the vastly greater amounts of iron from any copper concentrates, uh, a leaching process for the copper concentrates has thus far proved insuperable. How do we slay this elephant? The best way that this formidable beast can be dispatched is to convert iron in copper concentrates into iron oxide with a purity acceptable for steel making or for pigments. The only industries with capacities big enough to absorb the quantities of iron oxide that would be produced by a commercially sized hydrometallurgical copper smelter. To achieve the required purities, the best currently available technical solution is to use solvent extraction to purify the iron from all its contaminants. The most likely solvent extraction reagents for this purpose are either carboxylic or alkyl phosphoric acids, both of which have high affinity for iron. And then to make from that a pure hematite powder for direct use as a pigment, or probably better, following pelletization, sintering, and reduction to make 
directly reduced iron pellets, which could go into a, an electric arc furnace. Pure iron oxide can be produced by stripping the iron-loaded organic acids with hydrochloric acid and then using the well-established industrial process of pyrohydrolysis to convert the ferric chloride solution into hematite and HCl for recycle. An alternative but industrially unproven method is one which we developed at Imperial College 30 years ago at least, known as hydrolytic stripping where the iron-loaded carboxylic acid is put into a uh, autoclave with water, and the reaction with water brings about the precipitation of hematite directly from the organic phase and reforms the organic acid for recycle back to extraction. Well, that blatant plug for work carried out nearly 40 years ago, which is still waiting for a champion to pick it up and run with it, brings me to the end of this brief, I hope not uh, too long, probably overrun, account on how we got to where we are today with regards to iron disposal from hydrometallurgical processes. I hope it has helped some of the younger members of the audience to put the current research in this area into some sort of context. And maybe, just maybe, it will help bring forward the day of the demise of the Iron Elephant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Pleasure. I think, we've, I think you'll, have to, you'll have to meet John after the session to question him about what we're going to do about this gigantic Iron Elephant. But thank you very much. Okay, thank Appreciate you. you. Thanks, John. Well, last night you saw uh, introduced and, and awards given to two of our illustrious members of the IMPC. And I'm happy to uh, show you their photographs to, right now. Uh, our two illustrious candidates here are Professor Graham Jameson and Professor P. Soma Somosundaran. Uh, our first speaker that I will introduce is uh, Som. Som to his friends. And Som is a uh, gentleman that I think will impress you in, in terms of uh, the surface chemical end of, of uh, our industry. Um, Som, uh, Som is, was born in India about 77 years ago, and he, he said he thought he was the oldest uh, person, I think, uh, in the audience last night, but I don't think that's quite true. Anyway, we're very happy that he did decide to move to uh, Berkeley, California in about 1961, and uh, he joined with Doug Furstenau to complete his uh, graduate studies. He actually got a couple of his degrees in India before he uh, came to North America. Uh, I got to know Sam about 53 years ago, so it's a long time, and he's, he's a most impressive winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award by the IMPC. He, he graduated with a PhD uh, from Berkeley in 1964. Uh, after five years, then he went to work in industry in uh, International Minerals and Chemical Corporation and with Reynolds Industries. And then he joined Columbia University in 1970. He's actually been in Columbia University essentially since that time. And uh, he's won almost every award that you can imagine is available to someone of his character in, uh, in by this SME and, and by even our Canadian uh, award-winning units. So Som is, uh, he, he, was, he was invested as the first Lav Lavon Donaldson Crum professor in 1987 and the first director of the Langmuir Center for Colloid and Interface. And in 1998, the founding director of the National Science Foundation Industry University Cooperative Center for Advanced Studies in Novel Surfactants. He was also elected chairperson of the Henry Crumb School 
1988 and again in 1991, and chairperson of the Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Science and Mineral Engineering in 1992 and 1995. He was inducted into uh, the National Academy of Engineering in 1985. And as I say, he's gone on to, to publish hundreds of papers. He's won almost every uh, award you can imagine, including Godin Award, the, uh, the uh, Applin Award. He was even appointed, um, he was even appointed to the EPA Board of Scientific Counselors in 2014. So you can see that even though Psalm is uh, getting on in years, you might think, in, he's publishing papers and, and into very important positions in, even today. Um, he's also been elected chairman of the Chemical Society of Sustainability Committee, as well as Hazardous Risk Committee. So he's, in the later, later portions of his career, he's gotten into environmental protection. And he's very much involved in things like uh, enhanced oil recovery, oil spill remediation, oil sands, coal cleaning, sludge treatment, water tr wa wastewater treatment, heavy metals, and nanotoxicity. And he tells me that he spends about half of his salary paying for a horse. So please welcome me. Please join me in welcoming Sam, Sam to the stand to give his lecture. Very, very humbled and honored to receive this award, and I wondered what I should talk about. Usually, the speakers talk about their work, and I wasn't sure that it would be too boring or not. I asked Jim Finch, and he said, Yes, talking about your past work would be too boring. <laughs> so, I decided to talk about the problems and opportunities that what I'm going to do. The next 50 years, that's what I'm going to talk about, the problems and opportunities that we have to prevent and remediate what I believe is the number one problem facing the mining and mineral industry. And that is the water consumption and, and water waste and also the pollution. And we can do something about it. And if you want to change the public image of about mining, you should pay attention to this. The goal should be to reduce consumption, treat and recycle, so that you will have zero liquid discharge. So that's the number one problem. In this regard is the water tied up in the tailing ponds, and the failure of the impoundments, creating news and bad perception and all that. So question is, why so many failures, and what can be done about it economically and in an environmentally benign way? The absolute, why water? The three things that you need to live are water, air, and food. And one, water is one of the three essentials for life then. I would add also minerals for long, healthy life. You need the nutrients from minerals. Energy itself, people will argue, but I would say you can make energy from minerals and water. And also, if you ask the Californians at the bottom, you will see, they will say the fire, you know, the fourth biggest element can also be da dangerous. Now, I want to also give you an opportunity to make millions by listening to my talk. If you buy the, the, the painting, this painting, I have it here, original, by, from my daughter for $10. In five years, you will make 10 millions. If you buy this 
from my wife. Her name is there. For one dollar, <laughs> you will make one million. Now, this one, nobody is buying. So if I will give you one dollar if you would buy it. <laughs> and, but you will not make any money out of it. <laughs> so it's an opportunity. So one problem, the main problem, centers on water. In mining operations, most of the water is tied up as waste in tailing ponds and can become contaminated and do become contaminated. And this constitutes a lost resource of water. Lost, maybe not last also, maybe resource of water. There's not much water potable water in the world, only 3% or 1%, depending upon who you talk to, is potable. Another problem centers on the solids. The great majority of the mineral ends up being warehoused in tailing ponds, and the two must be separated. The water must be separated from the solids, and this, otherwise, you can have intermittent problems and it's oh okay do I say the whole thing again no okay <laughs> okay now um, there are some uh, lot of problems when this gets out of hand and here are some data that I got from EPA even though I am in the EPA Board of Science a chair all these views are mine, my only. But I do want to say that I have an opportunity to bring the government and the mining industry and the academia. I talk to the EPA people, they want to work with mining industry. Some of the mining industry also want to, but they're cautious, understandable, and I can facilitate that as an opportunity to bring all these parties together. So there are many hundreds of failures, and there are several thousands waiting to fail. <laughs> And even one failure can be catastrophic and can, be very, can give very bad negative public perception. And I was told by Mark Levy or Nimon, this year alone there have been 40 failures. You don't hear about all of it, all of it. there are 40 failures. The main problems with the waste are they are highly reactive, acidic, they could contain bad elements such as arsenic, selenium, cyanide, high salinity, and they have a pudding texture tie, tying up the water. Next, I'd like to show you some examples from around the world. Just a few. There are many. The recent one, most recent one, well, before that, the satellites shows that, uh, that, that some of these, they claim is the largest man-made structures, but I'm not sure because I would think that the, the Great Wall is probably the largest. But I would, so I would say among the largest man-made structures and their safety for life and environment is an essential need for in mining. And poor safety records reveal the need for enhanced, enhanced work. Now here are some examples. Last year, in the end of last year, you heard about the Samarco main, main mine tragedy in Brazil. In, it traveled all the way from the mine to Atlantic Ocean. And in two weeks, traveled 500 kilometers, killing 12 people just in two weeks and maybe more later, and leaving about 300,000 people without water. And there are other examples. Hungary, their aluminum plant creating a bloody plains. The iron is red, fortunately or unfortunately. The coal is black, black. you cannot hide it. And then in Canada, at home, there is Mount Poly mine disaster in 2014, August. In few days, it covered four, four square meter or kilometer from the pond. It was emptied. That was emptied in just in few days. Raising levels of selenium, arsenic, and other metals. The site had a history of failures. So what was, what happened? You know, we should have monitored and done something about it. Now, the most interesting one is in Russia. 
It caused this, what they call the, the Red River. The cause was a leak from waste pipes belonging to Norils, Norils Nickel. And there are many others. And in Canada at home, there are oil sand tailings. They are bigger, but they have been developing improved technology. And we have a lot to learn as to what they are doing. Of course, there are more failures because the growth of the industry is very high and cannot keep up with the technology. But they have improved technology that we need to live, we can learn from. Now, why? The next question is, why do you have the failures? But before that, we have to worry about the public perception. On the top right, you see the demonstration in Peru about the mining water, and at the bottom is the cartoon representing what happened in my state, in I should, my, where I was born, in Kerala and in India. Coca-Cola and Pepsi and others are, were accused of extracting groundwater to dilute concentrated coke that they ship. And they found pesticide in the water. Whatever the actual reason is, they, they, there was per, per, public perception and protest against coke and so on. So we, one has to worry about the socio-economic impact. Now the next question is why the failures and what can we do about it? Why the failures? Well, there are two main reasons that we have to think about. The structural aspect, engineering failures. These are civil engineering and construct, construction aspects. Dewatering and stacking is the, are the things that one to worry about. The other is strength of materials. How do you consolidate the slurry? And I will try to address these two is where we can do something about. Now, one interesting thing is that water dams don't fail as much. They don't fail as much, why? You see that the red, the red is uh, uh, tailing dam, impoundment tailing dams mining, and the green is the water dams. They don't fail as much. Uh, and they, because they are made in, in, one, it, in one shot, concrete, whereas the impoundment are done sequentially whether upstream or downstream, even though downstream impoundment is supposed to be safer, I'm not an expert in this, but read it safer, most of the time it's convenient to have upstream. They keep on dumping the, 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 uh, the, the young tailings upstream. And the young tailings have a problem. They, don't, they, have a, they hold a lot of trapped water. They are too soft. And so what happens is that you have a lot of these young ponds which are too soft, and what you see in this slide is the, the bottom one, 30%. Yeah, this one is the dilute one. The stress increases, and suddenly it decreases, and that's where failure can occur. Whereas the dense specimen lost strength, but continue uh, initially a little bit, but then continue to continue to. So what does it mean? We have to go for dense consolidated barriers. Can it be done? Yes. And I know a little bit about it because my first job was after graduating from Berkeley was with international minerals and I was exposed to the tailing ponds. That is outside, you see this beautiful Disney world, and outside is the thousands of acres of lakes. They call it lakes, lakeland, holding these ponds. They occasionally breach. They're much safety, much better safety record now. They, they breach emptying into the Peace River. And they settle to a solid content of like 25% in 10 years, that is not acceptable because if you send a truck, it's going to sink. You have to have 35% solid content. It doesn't happen very easily, but it can, be, it can be done. And you see plants above it, so you think it is soft. You send graduate students from the University of Florida, they never come back. I didn't say Columbia. <laughs> that, you know, that's near there. Now, why, why is this so? What are the reasons?
The possible reasons that, of course, these lines are consisting of fine-sized material, they are high surface charge, so they repel each other and they don't stay together. And also, the formation of network, which I'll show you in a minute, which traps water. So what we have to do, we have to provide pathway for the water to escape and also use binders, binding agents, to tie down the particles so that they don't give up when, it, when the stress occurs. So we use a number of techniques, starting with CAT scan. You can see by with CAT scan using sedimentation as to what happens. And you see some, uh, certain processes that I'll show you in the next slide. Now this has been, after we did this, used by petroleum engineers and others like Jan Miller about 10 years later. But we used the CAT scan first to look at what happens in sedimenting materials and in, and in flocks. So when I watched one Saturday night, no disturbance, this, slur, this, is the, this is a slurry that gels in about 30 seconds. And when you watch, what you find is the coarse particles come down, the bubbles escape, creating tears, and finally they come out like a, what I call microvolcanoes right here. And they sediment to about 12% solid content. So it is much less, still not enough, but it shows the importance of having to provide the, the solid, the, the pathways. And one way, and this is what happens then, you see the flocks, water is trapped here, and also here, you have to let the water escape. And then that will consolidate and give it, give it the strength. How can you do that? One way is to add coarse particles, because you, the, you saw the coarse particles were moving down and creating tires. So one way is to add coarse particles. And if they are hydrophilic, then they is much better, because hydrophobicity of the particles will let water uh, escape, but then there are other problems. Now, we tested this by adding quartz tailings, which, which is a byproduct, it's a product, take quartz tailing to slimes. What you find is that when you add quartz tailings, the sediment, this is the height of the slurry interface, sediment come down much faster. Even though I was told I should face this way, I, by the way, I face this way because Ro is very good. The person who is going to warn me about time is there, so I face this way. But she's very smart. If you see me dancing like this, because she has moved this way, so I'm facing this way. <laughs> it's fantastic. OK, so these are the two ways. One, you saw that the coarse particles, what it does. We can also produce bubbles, but that's not very economical. Now, another way that is if you, if you this is from a pond. It's very, very, very um, embarrassing. I sent this uh, paper to Sam Marcuson. He's here. So we, we had dinner day first today. He, he said, uh, uh, you know, it, one way is to look at the fact that the jarosite that uh, John talked about forms around, and they can diffuse in, and that's the best binder. It's very embarrassing. I didn't forget. So he sent me the paper. I looked at it. And you can see the white material precipitate. Now what does it mean? It means whatever binder you add, you don't have to cover in all the particles with it. You just have to have it around the periphery, let it diffuse, and bind it, bind it, hold it together. So this is, I think, one technique that we have to try. How else can we facilitate? What are the main forces? There are a lot of forces. There are zoo, I call it a zoo colloidal forces. But main force is, one, the electrostatic charge, Van der Waals, and the main one is the electrostatic charge which cause repulsion between particles. You have to control that. But also, more importantly, the polymer that can bind the, these are the two that we can control. And, and uh, Doug Fish now reminded me that there's a, there is a model developed by Kapoor, uh, the, a previous uh, winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award called Melbourne Murder. When you add polyacrylic acid, the particles become charged more and more. The, the point of zero charge changes towards low pH. 
And when you look at the yield strength, what you find is that yield strength maximum also shifts accordingly. So there is a relationship between the surface charge, the polymer absorption, and yield strength, giving an opportunity to model and scale the process so that you'll have maximum strength. Now, the, the various ways to add polymer, this slide shows that you have a combination of polymers and this really ties all the particles together and bound, increasing, the, increasing, their, increasing their yield strength. This is the opportunity that we have. Now, only thing is that the polymers, you have to remember, not only the amount of polymer adsorbed that matters, more importantly, the way they adsorb, the conformation. Con uh, th that slide shows really the, the uh, the effect of the polymer. Effect of the polymer, as you add polymer, it comes down faster initially. This is where you need the effect. Later on, other processes such as uh, Oswald ripening will bind it. So this shows that not only the amount adsorbed, the way it adsorbed matters to, to, to bind it. Very little attention paid, which was hard to monitor in situ. It was hard to monitor, but in collaboration with the professor, uh, late Professor Turo of Colombia, we developed techniques to monitor, and we know from this what conformation is best. Now, one thing is that it would be good if you don't have to add petroleum-based polymers. There are biopolymers available, and they are much, much east better use of extracellular bacterial port. They question is, can they survive? Can they produce that in enough quantities? And all that. But I think, I, I think one has a lot of work to do. I will not talk further about it. I have a talk at 2 o'clock in the rare earth section where we used microbes to extract uh, rare earth uh, from the phosphate tailing ponds. So I'll skip that part. Now, this has also been used. Um, uh, we used, there are other spills. You heard about the Gulf of Mexico oil spill. This was used, the bio was as used, and successfully uh, treated the oil much more rapidly. This, you heard about the Exxon and Gulf of Mexico. First they used this dispersion, blamed to be toxic. That's why I got a call from the EPA administrator, can we produce the green reagent? Yes, we can, but they wanted it tons. They wanted it right away on demand, this will be cheap. But it can all be done, but more research is required to produce this. Now, this was used in, and then it's covered in the Stephen Hawking's epi uh, episode of Brave New World. That can lead to disaster. Over a million gallons of controversial chemical dispersant were used to break up the oil slicks at sea. Science may have a new way to confront the disaster. Professor Somersenderen is obsessed with surfactants. I am a believer that the mother nature does it best, and that is done using biosurfactants, and they are produced by microbes. So the question was, can we use these biosurfactants that are natural and benign, biodegradable and environmentally compatible with the surroundings? A microbe called Bacillus subtilis did something very special. It produced an incredibly effective surfactant, formed a very tough film around the oil droplets and kept them apart. And the, and the next slide shows how this biosurfactant produces these robust films. So I'm going to, the, the Partha, he touches the, once it moves, can you make it go forward? Otherwise, I'll just explain it. Yeah, there, okay. So you can see we poke it and pull it. It doesn't break. Even at that point, it hasn't broken. It's like spider webs. It just doesn't break. So it's very, very robust. And this is, the, this is the, what is shown to be uh, stabilizing the, the oil droplet around it. So what are the future challenges and solutions? Sustainable practices, 
bio-based techniques, degradable. It will degrade six months later, only that's okay, because then other processes such as host wall ripening can take over. Greener reagents, how do you determine what is green? With the help of uh, Sam Marcus of Valley and others, we did a project where he have developed a greener index, looking at about 140 factors involved in greening, and we have, a, if you are interested, we can talk about that. Awareness and management, better characterization, monitoring. You have to see how these dams are working. You know, the EPA tried that and one of them failed. The contractors uh, didn't do a proper job. Zero discharge, develop techniques to process ore with recycled water, and then, as it's shown in the, on the right-hand side, mine tailings as construction materials. I was hoping, by the way, after that uh, thing came on, uh, Stephen Hawking in the Discovery TV, to get a call from Bollywood. I can leave Columbia. It hasn't happened yet. I'm still waiting for that call from Bollywood. Not Hollywood, Bollywood, you know. I can do the Bollywood dance much more, much more easy for me. So I, it looks like I am ahead of time, more or less. So I would like to acknowledge, but I'm going to show one slide. I'm going to skip to this and then come back to this. One slide, this is, came out in the chemical and engineering news last week. Uh, the, they interviewed us, Irina, Satish, and us, me. What's important here is that when this iron Iron can release lead. You heard about the flint. Lot of, lot of lead in flint water. When iron is, iron is there, it can, release, it can release the lead, and lead is neurotoxic. So we need to study the electrochemical interactions and have the pH and ionic strength in such a way so that this doesn't happen. So I go back to the, the uh, acknowledgement slides. How many, more, how many more hours, how many more minutes do I have? Oh, a lot of time, okay. So this is the acknowledgement side. Now, I asked my secretary to make a list of all the people who worked with me, and so he made me. But I noticed, I don't see my name there. So I asked, what happened, my name? He said, well, I don't think you did any work. You just went around and giving the talk, which is, which is really true. But a lot of other people who were, this is a partial list, People like Ray Farinato, who is here, is my, has been my great collaborators, many others who work, and there are, there are many companies which support us, or not all of the support now. I'm hoping that we'll get some of them back, some of the mining companies back to work with us on the water problem. And then these new students are not acknowledged. This is a party that we hold in the summer and this is my future graduate students running towards me very, very anxiously to work. But I, th I, get, but I think she has other ideas. So I really appreciate the opportunity to bring to you a very, very, the, I would say, number one problem that we should focus on and change the, we can change the image and do, leave the planet the way we found it. That's our, the, the fine, you know, and by conserving water, by recycling and zero discharge. So, thank you. Thank you, so. Hang in there. Thank you. We'll just take some questions. Maybe one. Let's take see. One question. All right, you can see that uh, Som is, is totally addicted to this field of surfactants and to environmental protection. Anyone have a question for Song? Yes, please. There, wait, there are, there's a microphone coming. Does it work? Okay, fine. Very quickly, I'm a geologist, mining engineer, geophysicist. Uh, last November, up the hill here, a prospector came to my house to show me a, a dark black rock looking like the carpet there. In that one could see small grains of micropyrite. Looking under his $30 
microscope. But also, one could see something I'd never seen before. Little micro worms eating the pyrite. There's now a new domain in geology, and it's not called geology. It's biological, and they said, well, it's now geobiology. Rather than being a biogeochemist, it's the biologists who will be giving you a lot of new answers. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Here, you, better, you better go back to the podium. No. You reminded me of a very important point. Uh, when I was working with phosphate slimes, which we wanted to dewater, we found that there are microbes growing there. And after a few months, they pelletized this slime so that you can step on it and it won't break. Let the microbes grow. They go there, go there and grow uh, because nutrients are there. And this means that all we have to do is optimize the growth for these guys so they can produce the polymers and surfactants and everything that is needed. And they can also extract. Today I'll talk about these, some of these microbes which can extract uh, rare earth from, from phosphate slimes. And they can, I, they, there is also a bug which can extract gold. I call them, I'm going to get into trouble, ladybugs, you know, ladies like gold. <laughs> they can go extract the enzyme, just complexes the gold. You don't have to do any of the, all this mining and everything. Just let them loose. But wait, they are waiting, microbes, they are waiting there in trillions. They're going to take over us one day unless we are kind to them. Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is uh, the second uh, Lifetime Achievement Award recipient, and that's uh, Professor Graham Jameson. Uh, Graham uh, was, was born, he's an Australian, and uh, I, I believe he's among uh, the eldest um, he's among the oldest uh, of our participants at this conference, and uh, which is great, I think. And uh, he he holds a, uh, a degree, a BA, BSc uh, from the University of New South Wales in 1960, and a PhD in 1964 from Cambridge, uh, both in chemical engineering. After leaving uh, Cambridge, he worked for two years in the oil industry in the United States, in California before joining Imperial College in, uh, in London. In 1978, he returned to Australia as Professor of Chemical Engineering at the University of Newcastle, where he remains today. He is best known for the discovery of a new flotation machine, flotation device for the mineral industry, the Jameson cell, obviously named after Graham. This has been sold worldwide. To date, this cell has produced export coal valued at over $36 billion. That's $36 billion. He has received many awards, as has Saul. Some of these have included the New South Wales 2013 Scientist of the Year and the 2015 Prime Minister's Science Prize for Innovation in Australia. He's had 116 installations of this Jameson cell. And I think uh, I, got to know, I got to know Graham about 40 years ago, so please join me in welcoming Graham to the podium to deliver his talk. And the title of his talk is uh, Flotation, a Fable for the Future. Graham. kick it off. Press the button, I suppose. Here we go. Um, this, uh, the talk I'm going to give is, is more directed, I suppose, to flotation specialists. But on the other hand, uh, flotation is so central to the minerals industry 
but I don't need to apologise for that. This, uh, the field that I'm working in is in the effect of particle size and bubble size on uh, flotation kinetics. And I started this work a long time ago at Imperial at the suggestion of uh, Dr. Joe Kitchener in the School of Mines who remarked to me that he thought that the chemistry of flotation was well understood, but the physics wasn't, and that there could be advantages in applying my knowledge of bubbles and particles to the recovery especially of ultrafines. But this graph uh, was produced by uh, Robin Batterham at the 2005 uh, flotation conference we held in Australia. And it's sort of haunted me ever since because on the left hand side, you'll see uh, a drop off in recovery uh, at the very fine end. But more importantly, from my point of view, uh, after reaching a maximum of around about 100 to 120 microns, there's a, a steep decline in the uh, recovery of coarser particles. And this graph really stops at about 350 microns. Well, I'm, I, my sights are set much higher than that. The, um, uh, the current work I'm doing was first uh, came to light in 2006. I've been trying for years, uh, lots of ideas, especially hydrodynamic ideas, to try to increase the rate of flotation of very coarse particles. And uh, I, I, I was trying to float coarse iron ore particles because I thought they would be rather a challenge. Well, they were, and I couldn't float them at all. And I thought to myself, is this a chemistry problem? Because the ore had several different colours in it. It was just na natural ore dug up uh, in the northwest of Australia. And so I thought, maybe I'll try something simpler. I'll go to silica and see if I can float that. And the silica, or this was sand, about half a, half a millimetre in diameter, typical beach sand where I come from. Uh, bubble size was three millimetres. So I was putting the air in through a capillary tube uh, in the hope that particles would capture, uh, be captured by bubbles in the fluidized bed and they'd rise to the top uh, and I'd be able to see them. Well, I certainly saw the bubbles because they got to the top of this little rig which is part of an undergraduate ex uh, fluidization experiment and uh, then they sat there and on the right you'll see the uh, raft formed on top of this liquid. Unfortunately, um, I couldn't see these particles because I needed new glasses. But my postdoc who was helping me said, prof, prof, there's, there's particles on these bubbles. And so I, I went and got a magnifying glass and sure enough, I could see them. Each bubble, we're looking down on a, a raft of bubbles and in the middle of each one, you'll see uh, a half millimeter, perhaps two or three even, uh, of silica particles attached to the bubbles. I'm just gonna have a quick look to see if you can see them. Yes, they're there. So that was really the start of all this because as soon as I saw that, I realized that this could become you know, a full-scale uh, industrial flotation device. And as time has gone on, uh, it's been taken it's quite, quite a while now since November 20, 2006, but over that time, I've done a lot more experimentation and I know a lot more about what's going on. And I think it's a really important breakthrough for, for flotation. Um, so, the development path that I followed were just the simple things that an engineer has to do. I needed to know a lot more about three-phase fluidized beds. Uh, there's not a lot in, in the literature about those compared with what's known about uh, bubbles of, of air, say, in gas fluidized particle, uh, particulate beds. And I used initially just graded silica and water to, just to um, replicate the fluid mechanics of the problems. Then I moved on to uh, other things but using sand or silica as a gang and pure galena and pure chalcopyrite as the values and then about two years ago we started to do work on real run of mine ores and, and coarse coal samples. The focusing questions that I had to an answer here were first of all how stable are three phase fluidized beds because one of the first problems I encountered was that as soon as you had uh, a two phase bed that is particles and water, uh, the water fluidizing the bed, that was quite stable. But when you put bubbles in, the, the bubbles would rise up at a certain point and then they would drag air from everywhere else and you'd get a channel going up through the fluidized bed 
and it would, uh, all the bubbles would go up there, the rest of the bed would collapse, and you wouldn't get any contact. So I had to do a fair amount of work there to, to learn how to make stable fluidized beds. Uh, I needed to have a, a particle capture device that would be able to process thousands of tons an hour of, of all. This is a big industry, so we've got to have something really uh, robust and uh, simple to operate and cheap to operate. And I also wanted to capture fine particles as well. I wasn't only looking at the coarse particle end of things, I wanted to look at the fines as well. And the other problem is where you're going to get this fluidization water. You don't really want to add water to your system, and so what you have to do is to take water out of the system and put it back. And all those problems have now been solved. Uh, and it, the result was this thing called the Nova cell. Um, in the bottom of it, you'll see there's a browny sort of color, which is a fluidized bed. And above that, I've written here a disengagement zone. And what happens is you, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a recycle line that, that takes water out of the top of the cell and puts it in the bottom. And on the way past, it picks up new feed and also air bubbles. And the, uh, the recycle is doing all the work, really, because the, uh, the aerator is a very high energy device, and it's good for picking up very small particles very quickly. But then the recycle line goes back into the bottom of the fluidized bed, which is just a bit above the minimum fluidizing velocity. And that's ideal for picking up coarse particles. So in this one device, where you're able to do the full size of uh, particles. I just want to notice the very last line on that slide is very relevant to what Som was talking about because the, the simplest way to stop having problems with fine particles in the minerals industry is not to make them in the first place. And that's what this device does because out of the bottom or out of the, out of the fluidized bed, we can get what I call the underflow. It's, it's really the main tailings. Uh, the solids are up to 65 to 70%. And if you look at the in the brown part of the fluorized bed, I've said there that the size range there is 120 to 600 microns. Well, that stuff is easy. It comes out, if you let it come out of the cell onto the ground, you can pick it up with a shovel. Uh, or you can just let it sit on a, have a conveyor belt. Conveyor belt goes past, picks up the solids, and the water will drain out on, on the belt, and you can just take it some other plant or put it back in the mine or wherever it will do most use. The mass balance on this thing is such that it, the other place where water comes out, the overflow, is really used for level control, uh, but also to take some of the, uh, the water out. The way uh, the test work that we've done says that if we crush to a top size of 600 microns, about half of the ore will come out at the top, the tailings will come out of the overflow, and the other half will come out in the bottom, the so-called underflow. Now that's important because what, what we're really doing, we're not stopping the manufacture of fine particles, of, of ultrafines, the top size of maybe 120 to 150 microns, but what we're doing is segregating them in this cell because the cell acts like a thickener and the finest particles get elutriated out of it and they go their, their own way. The, the coarser particles get uh, taken out the bottom. Now, if you've got half of the ore going out as in this coarse fraction, the other half of the ore is coming out at the same uh, size range as current technologies. In other words, top size of 150 microns or so. And that material uh, will have to be thickened and uh, dewatered before it can be dumped. But it, you've only got half as much as you would have in a normal mine. Um, in the top of this device, there is something there that got there, a cone. You can see an inverted cone. It got there for an odd reason. We were doing all this work in uh, transparent walled vessels, and we saw bubbles disappearing out of that line, out of the top of the recycle line. And so we thought, how can we stop bubbles from disappearing from the top of the cell and perhaps taking goodies uh, with them? Uh, they, they might just uh, be wasted. So we experimented with a few things, and we got this cone in there. And the cone uh, separates the bubbles very easily, because as soon as the bubbles uh, move over the cone, they are in a region 
where the downward velocity is quite low. And so they're easily able to rise up against the upward velocity, or sorry, they can be carried with the upward velocity into the, uh, into the froth if they're hydrophobic. So uh, this is a sort of a, it's a bit like uh, the, uh, the camel being a horse designed by a committee, but uh, there are all sorts of add-ons here, know-how if you like, that we've been able to, to uh, add to this thing to make it work better. Oh, there's another, there's a, a strong theory in the minerals industry and in flotation that there's a phenomenon called dropback. I, this, that is, coarse particles fall back out of the froth, uh, which is rising up, of course, rising up to the lip and trying to take them out of the cell. Well, myself and my colleague, Sahir Atar, have done a lot of work on dropback, both in the laboratory and uh, in operating plants. And on the whole, we, we, we struggle to find any. Because once you get into the, uh, once the particles get into the froth, provided the upward velocity is sufficiently high, they'll get carried out. And later on, I'm gonna show a movie where you'll see these tiny particles jiggling about on top of the froth, uh, dancing their way to the overflow lip. Um, the, I think that the, one of the reasons why this perception grew uh, came from uh, a university in this town because uh, in the late 80s, I think it was, there were people, they didn't understand uh, what's known as JG in the col column business. They were running cells with very low JG and that means that the, the frost was moving up very slowly and any old particle that happens to fall back with just enough equal and opposite uh, velocity will, will drain back. But the easy way to solve that is just to bung up the, uh, the JG, increase the gas velocity. So, um, but this, although I, we, we put it in to capture bubbles, what it does is it captures what we call cluster. And again, I have to acknowledge my debt to Sahir Atar because we did a lot of work on cluster formation in uh, flotation. And we see them, you'll see them in this movie. And the uh, clusters, rise very fast up through the system, but then they stick together. And uh, it, they, they get to the position where they reach the top of the column because they're more buoyant than the water. But when they, there some, seems to be an energy barrier for these clusters to get into the froth and they tend to sit around just underneath the froth. Well, that's what the cone can do. The cone picks them off and takes them away as a second product. Feed analysis. We, 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 we've done some recent work on a real ore, and in order to, to do that, we had to analyze, do a simple analysis, uh, size by size basis uh, of the ore. And we came up with a remarkable discovery here. Um, if you look at the green line, that is the copper in the concentrate, oh, sorry, the copper in the mass fraction. Uh, on the right hand side, you'll see a, a mauve square. That is the head grade, just over 1%, 1.01% 1 .01 or something. But you'll see that the, on the left-hand side, you've got the, the smaller particles, and they're richer than the 1%. But then as the particle size gets bigger, they become leaner. But what was remarkable to me, anyway, was all those points um, fall on a straight line. And I say everybody's used to doing experiments with scatter. And you look, look at a bunch of, of dots on a graph, and you say, oh, I'll draw a line through that, and I'll call that. Uh, you know, a, a correlation. But these particles, these um, uh, copper grades are spot on the line. And the, the standard deviation is just about nothing. And when I see a thing like that, I, it suggests to me that there's some natural law involved. Just like if you're trying to measure G by plotting something against another thing, uh, and it comes out to a particular value, well, that, there's something going on here. I'm not a comminution man, so I don't know what, what it is, but I throw that out uh, to the, uh, the crushing and grinding community. Um, and then, as I said earlier, we get uh, these uh, clusters uh, quite easily in coal. Recently, we've been floating coarse coal, two millimetres top size, because in our region, in, in Australia, uh, we have a lot of uh, coal exports, and there's a, a unit called a spiral, which is widely used to separate particles less than two millimeters. Well, I was given a sample of this uh, spiral's feed to see if I could separate it, 
and it floats like a dream. But what we saw was that just under the froth were uh, big aggregates of clusters of the bubbles and uh, coarse coal part particles. So we took advantage of, the, uh, of that cone, we sucked them out onto a uh, sieve bend and screened them off as a second product. It happens that they are much better grade, much lower ash in their terms, than the ash in the normal flotation product because that has got entrainment and that, uh, the, the ash just gets there by being present in the water that gets dragged into the froth. Whereas that sort of water, it, when it, we come, take the clusters out with the cone, that sort of water is uh, screened off by the, uh, the sieve bed. And as I've said on there, we, we can reduce the ash from 25 to 10% overall, but the product from the uh, clusters is, is less than 10. And the combustible recovery is 95%, which is, is very high. It means that there's very little coal left in the tailings. It comes out as a very pleasant coloured, um, like a, a tawny colour, instead of black as it went in. What I originally uh, called this slide, uh, so what, or something like that. But I became a little more conservative and I called it, uh, if we look at a, a particular base metal type of, of uh, circuit, it will look like this on the top uh, figure. You have a, a mill, often a sag mill, and it will grind the feed down from 100 microns, sorry, uh, sorry, it'll grind, grind it down from say six inches, 150 millimeters, down to uh, two millimeters. And so what you put into that mill will come out uh, at 100 units an hour, say. And then all, that all goes to a ball mill. And the particle size is reduced further from two millimeters down to 150 microns. Perhaps that'll be 150 top size before it goes into a flotation circuit combined with, uh, where roughers are combined with uh, cleaners. If you could find a way of floating material at two millimetres, then, or rather, uh, yes, if you could find a way of, of using that feed at two millimetres and removing uh, only the valuable bits, you'd be left with a tails, which would be 80% of the feed, and the uh, remaining 20% would then have to go on to a ball mill to be reduced in size, ready for flotation. But this, what I've done here in the bottom uh, table or figure, is to show where my uh, nova cell would go uh, in between the sag mill and the ball mill. Uh, you'll notice the size of the ball mill is much, much smaller. It's, it's uh, one fifth of the size of the, uh, the ball mill in the top uh, line because you're only, got a, you're only treating 20% of the feed instead of um, the 100% that was going in. That, that alone, the, the, uh, the, the ball mills use the most energy in the, a normal concentrator. They use more energy that just simply because they're doing a, a bigger job, a bigger ratio, if you like, of the entry part particle size to the, uh, to the final. And if you can reduce that down to 20% uh, of what it was before, that's an enormous saving. Um, I, uh, at this point, which was about five years ago, or three years ago, I got a bit worried because I said to myself, what if the costs in the concentrator are irrelevant to the operation of a whole mining ent enterprise? You see, that's quite feasible. You, you go to a, a mine site, and somewhere up on a hill, there's a, there's a little building uh, with the concentrator in it. And it's surrounded by you know, hundreds and hundreds of acres of, of mine site with enormous holes and uh, you know, excavators and other mechanical devices pulling up the, the ore. So I got these blokes who were very bright to look through the literature to see if we could find feasibility studies or design studies. And they found something like uh, 63 of these on the internet. We were helped very much by the Toronto Stock Exchange, which some years ago mandated that if anybody wants to uh, raise money on that exchange, even if the, the mine is not in Canada, they had to submit one of these feasibility studies. And it's got to be certified by you know, professional people and all that. Anyway, the upshot was that 
the data showed that the costs for mining and milling were, almost, were about the same, almost uh, within plus or minus 3% or so. Of course, you get outliers, but with a number like 63, you have got some confidence in saying that if you want to use a, uh, a rough rule of thumb, you would say the cost of the mining is 43% uh, this is operating costs, the milling is 43, and what they call GNA is 14. So what we do in the concentrator has a big economic impact on the, uh, the operating costs of a mine as a whole. And therefore, it was worth me uh, continuing with this line of research. And going back to those, um, going back to those, to that, to those uh, diagrams, we took those sort of numbers as a, uh, a sort of a, a template, or rather, not a template, but an example uh, we, where we could do, we have a look at the costs and see what the consequences would be if we put the uh, mauve colored no Nova cell at that point. And what it, we made a number of assumptions, but the bottom line was that the energy and media costs were reduced by 29% based on those assumptions. Uh, I should explain that in a concentrator, the best available published data says that about 70% of the running costs are due to grinding and to media. That is the energy of grinding and the, the cost of replacing uh, mill liners and balls. And uh, it just happens that they're about the same. And so if you make a big saving in the energy, you'll make a big saving in the, uh, the mill linings as well because they're both they're proportional. So the result of that was that the energy and media costs were reduced by a third, say, and the overall cost of running the mine and the mill reduced by 12%. So if you could go to a big operating mine like Olympic Dam or in Australia or some other place in, um, in Chile and told them all they've got to do is in, invest in a few of these machines, they'll get a 12% operating saving, which is not inconsiderable in these days. Now, we, uh, I, in doing this work, I came back to batch flotation, which everybody in, who does mineral processing uh, has to do at some stage in their career. And I have a, a great, greatly in, increased admiration for the amount of data that you can get out of a batch flotation uh, compared with what you can get out of a continuous operation. With, one, with a continuous operation, all you get is one rate constant at a particular time. With a batch cell, you get a continuum of rate constants over an infinite number of data points of time. And it certainly showed us interesting things about this ore. If you look at the top line, the blue one, that represents the, uh, crikey, what does it say? The, oh, the R infinity, I better talk about R infinity. In the, in the equation, there you'll see the recovery is equal to the R infinity uh, times that exponential function. The R infinity is the maximum amount of recovery you can get for a particular size uh, with, a, with a particular ore. And if you fit the data to an equation like that, which, and you get very good results on the whole, the R infinity might start off with uh, smallish particles at 100, 100%. That means that if you grind to a certain size, you can get 100% recovery. But as the size goes up, you'll notice that the, uh, the recovery is going down. And at 600 microns, which was the top size that we were interested in, the uh, recovery is only about 20% or so. Uh, and I think what's happening, these are 600 micron particles, probably the little inclusions of valuable mineral are actually very small. Say, say that they were only 100 microns, well, you could have lots of them in your 600 micron particle and not one of them might be touching a surface or only a small fraction. But that told us that no matter how, how hard we tried this ore, we were never going to get 100% recovery if we accepted all the particles. However, there's one uh, saving grace here, which is the mass fraction. If the mass fraction of the, those coarse particles happens to be very small because of the breakage process, then uh, it's not a problem. You throw them away and 
uh, it won't have much effect on your recovery, but it will have a lot to do with your energy because to get this uh, range of particle sizes, we only had to grind to a top size of, uh, of, one, uh, of 600 microns. If we were going to get very high recoveries and stopped, say, at, uh, at 300 microns, which that graph implies, you'd still be you'd having to put a lot more energy into it. Then on the bottom, the red, light, the red uh, points, that's the uh, rate constant. You'll see that you get the normal increase uh, at around about 150 on this graph, 150 microns maximum, and then that starts to decline. Uh, but it's not drastic. The, the, the rate constant of these coarse particles, the ones that float, are still quite high. Anyway, a nice graph, and I, I really am quite heartened by what you can get out of a batch test because it's so much easier to do than setting up a continuous one. Um, the next thing we did, I didn't put the equation up here. There's another equation which relates the rate constant to the, uh, the R infinity, the, uh, the one at infinite time, and the number of cells. And so we put our data into that, uh, that equation, and on, the, on this table, you'll see what sort of effect we can get if we uh, it, increase the number of cells. The, the bottom line, is, it, uh, literally the bottom line, says that you can get 94.47% uh, if you put in five cells in series, but that 94.47 happens to be the, the ultimate recovery for this ore. So nothing, if we add more and more cells, we're not going to get anywhere. But it, we'd only have to go back to three cells and we're almost at the same recovery. It's saying 93.99, 94% recovery, in other words, after three cells, uh, compared with a little bit more after five cells. So you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't need, really need to go to five, just stop at three. And you compare that with a, the bank of roughers on a big copper mine in, in Chile, for example, they could be nine or 10 really big uh, float cells uh, that are needed to get the recoveries. We can do that in about three. Um, and I, I put this little thing in because obviously if you're going to link cells together, you can look at the incremental change that you would get in both grade and recovery. The top line is the, rec the recovery. And we, only, we only have one cell, we only get 78% re um, recovery. But one more brings it up to 91, and two more brings it up to 94. So the additional cells certainly uh, add value. But then going to uh, the fourth cell, again, the, the increase is so small, I doubt if it would pay for itself. And again, the grade, if you look at the grade on the bottom, the, um, we start off at 1% copper, and then uh, that drops, the tails from that cell is only 0.24. But of course, that's the feed to the next cell. And down the line, you'll see that the grade of, the, of a given cell keeps getting lower and lower. And yet, we can still get something out of it. Uh, if you look at the second cell, for example, it's got a feed of 0.24% copper. Imagine somebody who finds a deposit uh, that's 0.24% copper and wonders if he's going to get anything out of it. Well, you can, but it becomes more and more difficult. Uh, we're, uh, we've reached a stage in our development now where we think we know what's going on and we know how to cope or even design a full-scale plant. But that really has to be everywhere. It has to be verified. You've got to be able to build a pilot plant. And the way I did this with the Jameson cell was that I had a device like shown on the left of that. Um, and it's not quite the... Uh, that is a prototype of a Jameson cell. Uh, the Nova cell would look similar, but the, to in, uh, include the fluidized bed, it would have to be a bit deeper. But the principle is very important. That uh, machine for the Jameson cell had, I think, 20 downcomers. That's the vertical yellow pipes. Why do we have so many yellow pipes? The answer is that we can easily build a pilot plant that consists of one yellow pipe and a proportional amount of surface area. And you can do all your tests on that. It doesn't take a, uh, a big chunk of feed out of the plant. Uh, once you've got the details of the, the recovery and the grade, you, can, you know 
that all you have to do if you want more feed, uh, more capacity, is just more and more of these things in series. The very first Jameson cells that I built were put into a coal mine in um, a coal operation in Queensland, and they just happened to have uh, a long space where they could put a series of rectangular cells, and that's how it was built, and it worked like a charm. But it's uh, it, easy to build a si si single unit like this and try it out. So in detail, or oh, sorry, in summary, we've got this new machine. Uh, particularly looking at coarse particles, but also the fines as well, we can get significant gang rejection and high recoveries. Next step is to build this full-scale unit and test it on site, but that's only going to be something with a downcome of this diameter, and the, the, uh, the cell would be more or less the, the, the surface of this combined table here. Uh, and we'll just scale them up. Now, the other two points there that were really important, I thought, were first of all the discovery of the... Uh, uh, of the, the, uh, form, the formation of clusters and their importance, and then the other one was the, that uh, behaviour of the copper grade as a function of particle size in the feed material. A bit of a mystery, that one. Well, now what I want to do is to show you, a, I want to thank my team. Uh, I didn't mention Sahir, but Sahir did a lot of the earlier work on clusters, uh, and she's got to be acknowledged too. And now I want you to enjoy this very short video. Thank you very much. If you could start the video. Thank you very much, Brim. That's great. Thank you. Great. And I think we have some questions. No, we're going to watch the video. Oh, good. Good. This is a fluid. This is a fluidized bed. Uh, it's got particles, as it said, about I think 200 to 600 microns of. Uh, of both sand and chalcopyrite. Uh, the bed has started to fluidize. At the very bottom, you will see a, uh, a, a small jet of water and particles coming in. Uh, in a moment, we're going to put the air on, and air will come up through the, the system. At this moment, the chalcopyrite has been put on top. Uh, it's been mixed in the bed of sand, and uh, it's, it is segregating to some extent. And here, the bed has almost stopped because we're waiting to put air in. And a ghostly hand will come out in a moment, up the top, and turn the air on. And you'll see that the bed begins to expand, and then uh, flotation will start. Now look at those clusters at the top. Big bunches, they're just like grapes. The, the concentration of the chalco was still only 1 or 2% in this material, but there they are in uh, the first material to come out of the cell. And they'll keep rising, they'll go right up to the top, most of them will remain stable, and they'll flow over into the concentrate. We can kick it off again, please. So there they go. On the left and the right, you'll see tubes uh, with material flowing in them, they're, they're maintaining the level. That's to take liquid out so we can maintain the froth depth. Now, the, um, the material, the, the chalco is almost all gone now. Um, there is chalco left on the sides of the vessel, uh, but they're stuck there. I don't know how we can get them off, but the chalco itself is virtually all, all left, left the system. Um, but there will be the odd particle that's detached from the wall, perhaps, and we're going up to the, in a moment to look at the top, and you'll see these tiny little black spots coming over the lip. Now, if the, if the resolution's good enough, we'll see those particles. You'll see a little black speck uh, fight its way. Those are bursting bubbles, I think. Oh, well, didn't work. But the, if you look at it by, with your eyes, you can see these things uh, coming over easily. Now this will uh, divert to a screen. Uh, we just had a 200 micron screen to capture the, the chalcopyrite. Oh no. Here we go. Now you look at the black spots in, in that froth. There we are. Look at that little, little uh, selection. They've risen up. They've been carried by the froth up to this point and You'll see them dance towards the lip as, as we turn the uh, start it up again. 
and these will keep coming for some time because I think they're being dislodged from the wall. And that's the material in the screen. So that's up to uh, five or 600 microns. So virtually everything we put in the system has now appeared in, the, uh, in this product. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, very, very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting.